We're going to look at Exodus chapter 10, where we left off, verses 1 through 20. And then we're going to flip over to uh, John chapter 17, the priestly prayer. So there's a lot of scripture, uh, and, and I'm not going to take a lot of time exegeting each verse. But there's a lot of scripture to go over, and I titled this, Cultivating a Missionary Mindset. So please listen carefully, for this is God's word. I'm going to start in Exodus chapter 10. I'm going to read the first six verses. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go into Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants, that I may show these signs of mine among them, and that you may tell in the hearing of your son and of your grandson how I have dealt harshly with the Egyptians, and what signs I have done among them, that you may know that I am the Lord. So Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh and said to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go that they may serve me. For if you refuse to let my people go, behold, tomorrow I will bring locusts into your country. And they shall cover the face of the land, so that no one can see the land. And they shall eat what is left to you after the hail. And they shall eat every tree of yours that grows in the field. And they shall fill your houses, and the houses of all your servants, and of all the Egyptians, as neither your fathers nor your grandfathers have seen, from the day they came on earth to this day. Then he turned and went out from Pharaoh. Okay, we've mentioned this before, but... Genesis, Exodus is a continuation of Genesis. It's the same author, so obviously Moses, but he makes it a point the, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. They keep, especially during these plagues, they keep referring back to Genesis 1 and 2. And the principle behind that is the creation reversal that's taking place because of sin. Because remember, in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, God creates. And he said, each day he creates, he says, it is good. And then sin enters into his creation. And sin affects every area of his creation. And this is kind of what the point is being made about these plagues. And the reason I bring that up is because you see in verse 5. In verse 5, it says, And they shall cover the face of the land, so that no one can see the land. And they shall eat what is left to you after the hail. And they shall eat... Every tree of yours that grows in the field. And it's that word grows. It's the same word that's being used back in Genesis 2.5. In Genesis 2.5, remember this is during God's good creation. He says, when no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up. And that's the word, sprung up. So the point that's being made repeatedly in Exodus is the reversal because of sin. God's good creation going through a reversal. And, you know, the same thing happens to every person that accepts Jesus Christ. A reversal is taking place. When we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, we're born again. We become a new creation. And, and a reversal is taking place. And you, you know, remember this. The full realization of fully being human and operating as God has designed us, without sin awaits us in heaven. Now think about this, what I'm saying here. So when you accept Jesus Christ, you're becoming transformed more into the image of Christ. A reversal is taking place. And, and you're being freed from sin. And you're becoming more like Christ. And, but it's not going to come to the full realization until the day either Christ returns or we die and be with him in heaven then we're going to be in an environment that has no sin, our body's not going to be corrupted, and we're going to finally fully be human like God designed us. Now look at verses 7 through 11. It says, Then Pharaoh's servant said to him, How long shall this man be a snare to us? Let the men go, that they may serve the Lord their God. Do you not yet understand that Egypt is ruined? So Moses and Aaron were, were brought back to Pharaoh, and he said to them, Go, serve the Lord your God, but which ones are to go? Moses said, We will go with our young and our old. 
We will go with our sons and daughters and with our flocks and herds, for we must hold a feast to the Lord. But he said to them, The Lord be with you. If ever I let you and your little ones go, look, you have some evil purpose in mind. No. Go, the men among you, and serve the Lord, for that is what you are asking. And they were driven out from Pharaoh's presence. Okay, there's a lot here. But uh, I just want to touch on a few things. First of all, this outward plague of the locust serves as a sign of inward emptiness of the majority of the Egyptians in that land. And what came to mind when I was doing this is Isaiah chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. In Isaiah chapter 4, it says, Hear the word of the Lord, O children of Israel. For the Lord has a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. There is no faithfulness or steadfast love and no knowledge of God in the land. There is swearing, lying, murder, stealing, and committing adultery. They break all bounds, and bloodshed follows bloodshed. Therefore the land mourns, and all who dwell in it languish. And also the beasts of the field, and the birds of the heavens, and even the fish of the sea are taken away. You see, the absence of the true knowledge, the true knowledge of who, of who God is, is reflected by this barrenness of this land of Egypt. And you see, what matters is how people respond to given circumstances. See, both Egyptians and the Israelites are being affected by these plagues. Israelites are being kept safe if they obey Christ and do what he says, but they're still being affected. And you see, what happens is it's about your inward character that you're able to bear with such afflictions through being, obeying God. It's through obeying God. Every time the Lord comes and he, and he uses uh, Moses to give a warning, he, he'll, he'll tell them, take, if you believe what I'm saying to you, then take your cattle and, and go to and put it under cover. Go to, in the land of Goshen, if you go to Goshen, you're not going to be affected by these plagues. If you obey what the Lord is telling you, you're going to be spared a lot of misery in this life. But understand, See, it's the inward character. And once again, a creation reversal is taking place in each one of us when we accept Christ. He's purifying us. He's making us more like Christ. And you have to understand that he sends us through times of testing and warfare, spiritual warfare, in order for us to grow spiritually. And this is what's happening for all these Egyptians and Israelites. They're going through plague after plague, God's given them a warning. Pharaoh continues to harden his heart and will not obey. But those who obey the, the warning are spared. And it's only through death that we experience what being fully human is like. We, we just Remember again, we are ushered into an environment that has no sin and that our spiritual warfare is over. But in this life, he sends us through hard circumstances to develop our inward character. And he sends us through spiritual warfare in order to strengthen us. Look at verses 12 through 20. It says, Then the Lord said, to, Well, one more thing before I go uh, get there. In verse 7, it says, Then Pharaoh's servant said to him, How long shall this man be a snare to us? And that word, uh, well, actually, it's the word man. In the Hebrew, it's really hard to describe what this word means. But it's like a pest. It's like he's saying it's the snare of a comet. He's saying this person who's bringing all this trouble on our life, just let him go. Haven't you had enough? And beloved, this is what happens when the Lord uses us to witness to somebody, a friend, somebody in, at our work, somebody that in our area of influence, we may witness to that person and you know what? Other people around watching, or even that person you're witnessing to, things may start getting hard, but they know, they know inside that you are speaking the truth of who Christ is. And it convicts them. And sometimes things may get worse in their opinion, in their life, and you say, just keep your Jesus to yourself. Don't keep harping on me. I don't want to change. And this is kind of what it's saying here. Pharaoh's servant said to him, how long is this pest 
going to be a snare of it. Just let him go. He's causing more trouble than what's worth it. And that's how some people react to the word of God. But look at verses 12 through 20. It says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the land of Egypt for the locusts, so that they may come upon the land of Egypt and eat every green plant in the land, all that the hail has left. Yet Moses stretched out his staff over the land of Egypt. And the land brought an east wind upon the land all that day and all that night. When it was morning, the east wind had brought the locusts. The locusts came up over all the land of Egypt and settled on the whole country of Egypt. Such a dense swarm of locusts had never been before, nor ever will be again. They covered the face of the land, so that the land was darkened. And they ate all the plants in the land and all the fruit of the trees that the hail had left. Not a green thing remained, neither tree nor plant of the field, through all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh hastily called Moses and Aaron and said, I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you. Now therefore forgive my sin. Please, only this once, and plead with the Lord your God only to remove this death from me. So he went out from Pharaoh and pleaded with the Lord. And the Lord turned the wind into a very strong west wind, which lifted the locusts and drove them into the Red Sea. Not a single locust was left in all the country of Egypt. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not let the people of Israel go. Notice that it's an east wind that brings the locusts, and it's going to be the east wind that departs the Red Sea. And, you know, the principle behind all this, I, I believe, is whenever the Lord's, he's sending these judgments, this is like the ninth plague here, and they continue to get worse. They're progressively getting worse. But they make sense. They actually make sense. And if, if you're in tune with what the Lord is doing in your life, you can start seeing a lot of times a pattern of what he's doing. Sometimes, even for non-believers, he will come and he'll be gentle with warnings at first. But if you don't heed those warnings, they become progressively worse. Because he's going to get your attention one way or another. And, and you see, the blackness, it, it's a progressive darkness also in verse 15. It says, they covered the face of the whole land so that the land was darkened. Now we're going to see next week, when we get to verses 21 through 29, that's actually the ninth plague. Is going to be the plague of darkness. But already we see a pattern happening here. The land, it says, was darkened with all the locusts. And now the next plague is going to come is the, is the plague of darkness. And there's going to, I guarantee you there's a lot of Israelites that went, now I'm beginning to see what the Lord is doing here. And you're going to have non-believers saying, I can see what's happening here. It's all making sense. The Red Sea, when the east wind parts the Red Sea, I guarantee a lot of them put it all together and, and it made sense to them what the Lord is doing. You see, everything the Lord does and permits in your life serves a purpose. Everything. Everything the Lord does there's a reason behind it. And when we draw closer to Jesus Christ, we are able to make sense of why things happen the way they do. I, well, not everything but a lot of things. That's what a relationship with God is. We may even anticipate or understand why and what the Holy Spirit is doing and preparing us for. It makes sense when we're in that vital, obedient relationship with Christ. He's not trying to hide stuff from us. And, but I see another purpose here. You know, when you look back at verse 2, in verse 2 it says, and that you may tell in the hearing of your son and of your grandson how I dealt harshly with the Egyptians and what signs I have done among them, that you may know that I am the Lord. You see, we see another purpose behind these plagues. It's not only that the Egyptians may come to know the Lord, but that believers, the Israelites, are able to take the word of God and give it to future generations. And that's what he wants each one of us to do. The word of God is not meant to be kept secret, but what the Lord has revealed in the Bible for us to proclaim. That's what he's saying here. The Bible is meant for us to remember, 
and teach the present generation, but also for future generations, so that the whole world may come to know who God is. That's what we're here for. And actually, if you want to break it down, the book of Exodus is a missionary book. And why I come to that conclusion is because when you compare, and we've done this before, but when we compare Genesis 1, 26, 27, 28, where it says, let me get that really fast. It says, uh, God, so God created man in his own image. Yet the image, in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Remember, Israel was in the center of God's will, way back in Exodus 1, when they were multiplying, being fruitful and multiplying. And what did Pharaoh do? Not this Pharaoh, but it was the Pharaoh before this Pharaoh. He said, they're populating way too much. We need, they're going to be stronger than us, they're going to overpopulate us, and then they're going to, turn, they're going to t drive us out of our own land. So this is what we'll do. Let's kill all the male infants so they're not able to raise an army up. Remember that? And that's where Moses comes into the picture. But what was Israel doing at that time? They were right in the center of God's will, yet they were being persecuted. And you see that, we look at, so we're beginning to see, when you, when you roll that around your mind, you begin to see the nature of this conflict is, that's becoming clear now. Pharaoh seeks to undermine God's purpose, not only for Israel, but for the whole world. And people are, are they, they're ignorant of this fact, because they're blinded by Satan, right? When somebody refuses your witness, and somebody refuses, uh, and you get persecuted because you're in literally in the center of God's will, and the person that's persecuting you, well, the person that's not listening to your witness, you never give up on them because you were in that position before, but they, they're undermining what God is trying to do. They don't realize it, but that's what's happening. But you look at Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 through 3. In Genesis 12, it's the call of Abram. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. This is what's happening right now. God is sending these plagues, and he's putting together his nation. And that nation, Israel, when it comes out of Egypt and bondage, is supposed to be a witness to the world. What does Paul say in Romans 9? I've given you the oracles of God to be a witness to the world. The Messiah is going to come through you to be a witness to the world. I'm going to save you in the midst of the whole world so that you can be a witness. So Pharaoh, he doesn't realize what he's doing, but Pharaoh is undermining God's purpose. And that's what people do. Uh, the Lord's purpose concerning Exodus is to make Israel a nation through whom he's going to manifest his word. Notice also, before we, we move on here, we, we talked about this a couple weeks ago, Pharaoh's magicians have abandoned him long ago. Right? When you look at chapter 10, it says his servants, not the magicians, but his servants said, and let this people go. He's put them a snare to us. No, we're the magicians. And I believe, it's only my opinion, I believe where well, the magicians were tapping into spiritual power when they were throwing the rods down and they were coming into maybe being a serpent and all that. They were actually tapping into the occult. The magicians were. And whenever somebody is tapped into the occult or some other type of spiritual power, they know they have tapped into spiritual power. They understand they have. And yet when they meet either a Christian or in this case, Moses, and, and, and God's working through Moses, they know there's a greater power of work than what we've ever experienced. And, and I think they're the one, a lot of them came to faith. 
in my opinion, they're not there anymore. They understand what's going on here. Have you ever noticed? It's happened to me, and I'm sure it's happened to almost everyone here. You're sitting in a workplace. You're sitting at even a family gathering. You're sitting somewhere, and everybody goes around the table, and they give their view of what they think religion is, even Christianity. And there's no conviction. There's no conviction at all. But then Judy opens her mouth. Marge opens her mouth and starts talking about the true Jesus Christ and what happens. There's conviction, thick conviction in that room. Because we're ambassadors of the true Jesus Christ of the Bible. And there is more power than you can imagine when you witness to somebody. And that person, I don't care, you can look back at your own experience. That person knows, just like Pharaoh knows here, they're hearing the truth. They're, they're dealing with a God that's different than what they've dealt with before. And they're either going to say, get this pest away from me. I don't want to hear it anymore. They either, their hearts become more hardened or they become sensitive, just like these magicians. And, and they realize what is going on here. And that's why I say what God is doing, he does this throughout his, actually the whole life, the whole history of the world, I should say. It's a missionary uh, mindset is what he's trying to cultivate. He's, he's doing these plagues not for our entertainment, but to form a nation to be a witness. And now Jesus Christ comes. This is where I want to get to in John 17. Because we have a meeting coming up on the on the March second, I believe it is, the planning meeting, and we have the we, we met before and we came up with some ideas. How can we impact the the Klamath Falls? How can we draw people in? What is our mission going to be? And we have what twenty things back there that we're going to vote on, one through five. And I, I just before we vote on this, we need to pray about it. We need to understand who we try to target on and on. And so I, this came to mind. John 17 is going to give us a lot of the answers of what a missionary mindset should be. And I'm going to start at John 17. I'm going to read the first five verses. In, the, in this prayer right here, verses 1 through 5, Jesus is praying for himself to the Father. And this is important. Verses 6 through 19... He's going to pray for the disciples, literally the apostles. And then verses 20 through 26, he's going to pray. He's praying for each one of us, all those that are going to believe him in the future. But he starts out in John 17, 1 through 5. He says, when Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you since you have given him authority over all flesh, to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Okay, first, Thing, two things really fast on these verses. One, this is one of the clearest expressions that Jesus Christ is God. Now I'm, I'll show you in a second here. Jesus Christ is 100% God and he's 100% man. And those natures never mix. It's what they say in John, the unique, one-of-a-kind son of God. That's where there's, there's no other being like it. He's God who became human flesh. He laid aside his glory, not his deity, when he became man. He's God. It's the Trinity. And the reason I say that is because he says, give me the glory that I had with you before the world was. And you go to just a couple verses, but you go to Isaiah 42.8. In Isaiah 42.8, he says, I am the Lord. That is my name. My glory I will give to no other, nor my praise to card idols. And you go to Isaiah 48, 11. In Isaiah 48, 11, it says, For my own sake, for my own sake I do it. For how should my name be profaned? My glory I would not give to another. It's only logical. 
God, we don't become God. I know some religions teach that uh, eventually you're going to become God. You're either God or you're not. You're either the creator who came into being, he just is, or you're not. And so Jesus says, Father, give me the glory that I had with you before the world was. And the Father says, I will not share my glory with another. So Jesus is God. But also look at this. It says uh, that they may know you and me. Okay? And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence, the glory that I had with you before the world existed, but that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Intimate fellowship is not just intellectual knowledge. So what is it saying, James? 2.19, even demons believe and tremble. It's about having an intimate fellowship with God. There was a person on the news this week that said, well, it's okay to pray to Jesus. Just that if you think Jesus is speaking back to you, then there's, you're weird. There's something wrong with you. That's what she said. And I didn't get offended when I heard that. What went through my mind was, that speaks volumes of you. Because any relationship you have, if only one person is doing all the talking, it's not much of a relationship, is it? Matter of fact, I say it's not a relationship. A relationship is when you do the talking, and so does the other person. You, you mutually talk to each other, get to know each other. That's a relationship. So if Jesus doesn't speak back to you, you're probably not in a relationship with him, right? But look at verses 6 through 19. It says, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them, and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Let me stop there just for a second. Remember, Jesus is praying now for the apostles in these verses. And they are participating in his mission, and this is important. The honor and revelation of Jesus is displayed in the life of the church. And it's displayed in the life of the apostles. Jesus is sending them on a mission, which is going to be clarified even more in a second here. But look at verses 11 and 12. It says, where are we at here? I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except the sign of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Okay, this is eternal security right here. We're Baptists. We believe in eternal security. But I'm telling you right now, there's scriptural warrant to it. It's all over the Bible. But let me focus on these verses right here. It says, I kept them. I protected them. Then he says, Holy Father, I'm coming to you, so guard them. Whatever Jesus prays to the Father, because he's sinless, God answers him. He prays according to the Father's will. But what's interesting to note is when he says, you kept them, kept them. It's a, it's a one a certain word that's being used. Then he switches it to guard. And this is a good translation because it's a different word that's being used. Guard them, Father. It's an even a more intense meaning of that word. If, the, if, if Jesus is asking the Father to guard the apostles and us, that he will not lose one, then we're eternally secure. But you know what it reminded me of? It's 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 4 and 5. In those verses, as I was looking through this, I thought, is this the same word, guard? Kept, guard are two different words. It's more intensity in guarding when it says guard. But then you go to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 5, or 4, and it says, uh, 
protect the salvation. Protect the salvation. Your, your salvation is guarded. Let me just read that really fast. It says, uh, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. That word guard is a different word, and it's used only four times. And that word guard, he's saying guard, believers. It's a military term that means like a garrison. Put a garrison around this person. And so he keeps us. He's our high priest. He doesn't fail in his petition to the Father. And in that word, in Hebrews, when we talk about the high priest who continually makes intercession for us, continually, that word means perpetually uninterrupted, is what that word means. He continually has Mike in his continually has him and before and praying for him. He's praying for Lois continuously, perpetually, uninterrupted. And whatever the son asks the father, the father gives him. Well, let's move on. Verses 13 through 20. It says, But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in them. That's what Connie was talking about today in Bible study. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. You're a pest. Ida, you're a pest. Just don't talk about Jesus to me anymore. Send this guy away. He's causing all this trouble on us. The world hates us. Verse 15, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. So here we're starting to get a clear picture of what our mission is here on earth. Earth is not our home. We saw that in 1 Peter today. But it is the location of our mission. And this is important. The place where God is still at work through us. The place of believers during this lifetime is not, or not to withdraw from the world, but remain in it and influence it for good. We hear it all the time, earth's not my home. Well, it's not. And we're going to get to now, officially, my favorite verse in a minute here. Earth is not our home. I understand that. We're pilgrims. But beloved, while the Lord has us here, he wants us to carry out his mission. And his mission is to proclaim who he is to the world. And, and our location is here right now, wanting to carry out Christ's mission. Not like Jonah or Elijah. Even some of us at times may, may just earnestly say, I just want to go home. Well, there, it's, what's your motive behind that? For Jonah and Elijah, they literally were despondent over thinking that their ministry should have went another way or they didn't like what God was telling them to do. So they said, just take me home, Lord. But you see, the Lord said to them, and he says it to us, I'm not through with you yet. I want you here so I can work through you. In verses 20 through 26, now he's going to start praying for us, for believers. In verse 20, it says, I do not ask for these only, the apostles, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Now let me stop there just for a second. I say this like I'm beating a drum all the time. But the Lord's going to accomplish whatever he's going to accomplish through you. And guess what? There's nothing you can do about that. You can either make it easy or you can make it hard. He's going to accomplish his purpose in your life. He's praying for the apostles in verses 6 through 19. Okay. Then he goes, then he says in verse 20, he says, I do not ask for these only, but all those who will believe in me through their word, through the apostles' writing of the New Testament, through the apostles' writing of Scripture. It's as if Jesus is saying, as he's praying for the apostles, your mission is going to be successful. Because now I'm going to pray for all those that are going to believe me through the word of God that you're going to provide. And that's what he says to each one of us. But look at verses 21 through 
26. Then he says, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them, and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them, even as you loved me. Let me stop there for a second. 20 years, some odd years ago, whenever it was, when the Lord really used this verse to really speak to me, to just magnify it in my sight. And I almost threw up. I almost got sick. I got nauseous. Because look what that verse is saying, 23. That you love them even as you love me. Believers. God the Father loves his people, loves believers as much as he loves Jesus Christ. Let me go on to 24 through 26. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me, because you love me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I make known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known, that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. Verse 24 has officially become my favorite verse. Because in verse 24, let me read it again. Father, I desire, whatever Jesus desires, Father gives him. I desire that they also, whom you have given me, all those that are going to believe on Christ until he returns, may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me, because you love me for the foundation of the world. The whole purpose of salvation, the whole purpose of it, is to experience the fullness that lies beyond this age. That's the whole experience. That's the reason he saved you. It's the reason he saved Marianne. So that not only can Marianne carry out the mission while she's here on earth, away from home, to proclaim the name of Jesus Christ, but that one day, either when Christ returns or she dies, she's going to be ushered into heaven and see the fullness of Jesus Christ. See the fullness of God. That is what the whole process of salvation is leading to. You know, uh, the mission of the church, when you take it all back, you start with Israel becoming a nation. Jesus Christ praying for us before he goes to the cross is to reveal the beauty of God to the world through our unity. Not only through our unity with God, that's attractive to people, trust me. They know when a true Christian has an intimate, personal relationship with God. They know that. They sense that. But also, the unity that we have here as a congregation and with other Christians. That attracts people. Obedience to Christ, what does it say in 1 Corinthians chapter 10? Some of my favorite verses. Take your thoughts captive to be obedient to the Lordship of Christ. Obedience to Christ. When you hear him, yes, he speaks to us. When you hear him and you obey him, you're glorifying him and people see him. People recognize that. And fellowship with other believers glorifies God. And once again, I meant to do it, but I didn't. There's a verse in Psalms. I cannot remember where it's at. But it says, it's nothing the Lord loves more when, when believers are fellowshipping with each other. It's like oil running down Aaron's beard. It's some, and that's what he's saying. And beloved, when we uh, have that planning meeting coming up, that's what, we have to, that's what we have to orient our minds around. What is going to attract the community to seek God, to come here? How can we make it convenient for them to come and worship? That is kind of what the mindset has to be. Um, 
I've said it, and I'll, I'll leave, leave it with this here. I've mentioned it before, but I don't care what denomination you go to, I don't, I, I don't care. If you believe in the Trinity, if you have a good grasp of the, you know, the Trinity, and we talk, to me, you're my brother or sister, who am I to say you're not? If you believe who the true Jesus Christ is, and I've mentioned it before, but I, it's like standing on holy ground. When I'm talking to another Christian, when I'm talking to Frank, it's like I'm standing on holy ground because the Holy Spirit's in him. The Holy Spirit's working in him. And that's the kind of the fellowship, the unity of believers that, it, that the Lord uses, let me put it that way, that the Lord uses to attract people into his kingdom. 